Good morning, and welcome to Tuesdays with Tormla. Rick Tormla here, and joining me today is, uh, we've got a call already. Good morning. Welcome to Tuesdays with Tormla. Hello, Rick. This is Norm. Norm Curlin. Uh, gee, Norm, you got, before I could even give you your fantastic introduction. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. And uh, just want you to know, I've got Peter, Paul, and not Mary, Leonard with us today, okay? <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I'm going to introduce you, Norm, because you're far too uh, um, uh, modest. But uh, Norm is a lawyer economist who um, was a civil rights investigator, worked with Med Gravers, and worked then for the Kennedy administration, the Justice Administration. Good morning, Peter. And the, uh, uh, went on to work with Walter Ruther in the Citizens Against Poverty, right? Citizens Crusade Against Poverty. Citizens Crusade. How could I forget a crusade? <laughs> Citizens Crusade Against Poverty. And uh, then went to work on the War on Poverty. And uh, you uh, worked under the Johnson administration there. Then you hooked up with the great economist Louis Kelso. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and Mr. Kelso convinced Senator Russell Long, the Kingfish's son, to uh, support ESOP, the employee share. The, help me out with that. The em uh, employee stock ownership plan. In employee stock ownership plan. Okay. Um, and then uh, he moved on to a lot of other things, but right now he is president of the Center for Economic and Social Justice, and he's going to tell us about a plan that is a real alternative that we can, we can use along with, uh, I, I think, distributism, but we won't get into that this morning, uh, Norm, but uh, uh, that can actually help empower people and... Um, Get, get people back working again and spur our economy. So, Norm, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Rick. You know, as a matter of fact, I found a quote from Hilaire Belloc that if you want, it may, may take, it took me maybe a minute uh, to, to read, but I do think that Belloc was on the same track in describing what's troubling America and the world today. Well, go for it. Okay, here, here's what he said. This is back in 1938. He says, society had, had fallen, much as our society has today, into a tangle wherein the bulk of men were disappointed and angry, and seeking for a solution to the whole group of social strains. There was indebtedness everywhere. The power of money and consequent usury there was slavery everywhere. Society reposed upon it as ours reposes upon wage slavery today. There lay upon the free men, already tortured with debt, a heavy burden of imperial taxation, and there was the irritant of existing central government interfering with men's lives. There was the tyranny of the lawyers and their charges. Don't take that personally, Norm. <laughs> Pardon? I said, don't take that lawyer part personally. <laughs> now, well, well they don't. Te unfortunately, they don't teach lawyers justice in the best of the law schools. <laughs> well, it, you know that Be Bellick was always on the mark, and as is uh, you pointed out before, it was one of the founders of uh, distributism with uh, Chesterton. And let's let's start, uh, Mr. Grotenrath. Uh, Dr. Curlin, where was that quotation taken from? Uh, okay, it was in. Uh, well, you could get the, it's called the Great Heresies, uh, page forty-five. It's republished in nineteen ninety-one. Yes, I, I have the book. I was just wondering which Ten books. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyway, the uh, I, I knew he had the book, so I didn't know why he asked the question. But uh, <laughs> he probably was confused about which book it was. He's an aging gentleman, so you've got to cut him some slack there. Well, we're, we're both uh, up there then. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> let's um, start with with something that people have been uh, emailing me about, which is the – and then we'll get into the federal – reserve system, what it is, and then we'll get into capital homesteading. And I'm going to try and act like a traffic cop today, Norm, so we can get all we need out of you, or as much as we can utilize right. uh, your knowledge on a very complex 
subject, but I think you received the uh, messages I sent you yesterday, right? Yes. Okay. It, it, let me just go, <laughs> go over the, uh, the executive order controversy where it said uh, President Kennedy issued an executive order, and it's 11110, that uh, um, people claim he was um, trying to get control over the uh, Federal Reserve Board, but it looks to me like what he was doing is uh, using his authority to to stop the redemption of uh, silver certificates. Yeah, uh, you know that may be right, and and uh, I know some people feel that there was a, that that caused his assassination uh, behind the scenes. But uh, you know, there I think Kennedy was seeking to improve the country. He had many fine, fine uh, uh, objectives. Uh, I don't agree with all of them because I, I reversed myself when I learned about Kelso's approach to solving uh, the problem of how do you grow an economy in a democratic way, you know. But, but uh, uh, you know, I'm aware of that. Uh, I don't know what to say, right? well, because I'm not a conspiracy theorist. No, well, I just wanted you to uh, d to clarify that that uh, uh, that wasn't a particularly good reason to take out the president of the United States. Oh, uh, obviously not. You no. know, I think for for all the guests and all the uh, all people listening, I want to make a, just a simple statement, uh, very simple that Americans believe in political democracy, you know, whether you call it the Republican form of, of, of democracy or representative government, but they believe in it. But political democracy doesn't work without a property-based market system of economic democracy. Now, if someone has a simpler, more populist plan to achieve a more inclusionary approach to economic democracy, let them come forward to challenge us. If they have a better plan, I'll, I'll jump aboard. Well, the, well, Norm, the system is the problem, and the system can, and that's the, that's the issue. The well, system well, let, is the problem, and let's it was explain, made by people, and it can be changed. Let's explain what, because this really needs to get out in the simplest, truest, and breaking it down for the public because they do not know what the uh, Federal Reserve System really is there for and what it does. Yeah, it, it, you know, the Federal Reserve simply is, norm, simply. is a part of the problem. The Federal Reserve was is a creature of the law. It doesn't exist except uh, by the fact that Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And there are conflicting views of what it was supposed to do, and then let's see what it is. What it was supposed to do was if uh, there's a section in the Federal Reserve Act, Section 13, was originally paragraph one, was to develop a flexible currency so that if they divided the country into 12 different districts, so that if any one district, they had uh, agriculture, industry, or commerce, had a need for credit to grow the economies where they didn't have enough savings in the district, that the Federal Reserve was created as a way to what they call rediscount, rediscount eligible paper for industry, agriculture, and commerce. In other words, it's productive credit. It was supposed to be, there's another way of saying it, monetize productive credit, asset-backed credit, things that were going to be produced and also uh, uh, be consumed. Okay, Norm, I have a couple of questions to that that some of our listeners have asked me to ask you. Sure. One is, does the Federal Reserve Board, um, are they the ones who, who uh, say the, with the debt ceiling, the increase in the debt ceiling, there has to be more borrowing, so there has to be more printing of money, right? Right. So Congress authorizes the printing of money, correct? <laughs> Right. The Federal Reserve doesn't do that. No, that's right. Okay. It, it, and, and, and just make a quick point. Just think of a house. If a household spent uh, had, had spent more than it earns, they'd be in trouble. And right now, the government 
only get 60% of what it was to spend out of taxation, out of revenues. So that means that deficit spending, and this is taking place not just at the federal level, but also at the state and, and local levels, that, that represents you. The question is, was that smart finance? Was that smart to finance out of deficit? Well, before we get into that, Norm, I, I just want to get these questions out of the way so we can clarify right. the role of the, uh, of the federal. federal. So does the Federal Reserve then uh, lend money to the – does the is the printed money given to the Fed and then the Fed loans it back to the government at an interest no, no, rate? No, it's it's it, it starts backwards. You gotta you gotta look at how credit flows through the system. Well, hold on a second. Just just explain though. Yeah. Very yeah, simply. You, you have to look at the process so that you okay. can see where the Federal Reserve comes in in the printing of money. Okay. Okay. The the, the process. The, in order to understand money. It isn't just currency, and there are a lot of people who think that's what it is, where the federal government has currency, that's what money is. So the first thing you have to understand is money is anything that can be used to settle a debt, anything, okay? Mm -hmm. So that two people together, in, a, in effect, create money when one gives one something to someone and expects something back in return. That's money, barter. Is, is a form of money. Once you understand that, then you have to start understanding what is credit. Well, credit is only promises. Now, there are good promises you can make, and then there are other promises you can't keep. That's bad credit. Consumer credit and much of the credit and government debt is bad credit. It's nonproductive. It doesn't produce anything that people can eat. Okay? So that's bad credit. Okay. Good credit is what grows an economy. Good credit is credit that you use to acquire things that you, you can support with future savings. That's the best form of credit, is, is credit in which it's backed by whatever you're going to produce in the future in terms of services or goods for local, national, global markets. So there's something behind it, but it is it doesn't exist right now. But but that's productive credit. And that is most of the money comes that way. Now, okay, so so what happens is uh, let's look at productive credit. A a company, take General Motors, needs a billion dollars. Okay, how's it gonna get it if you don't do it in the conventional way? Well, one way is to sell new shares. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then in that way they can get the billion dollars and, and pay for, pay for mm -hmm. the, they get credit, or well, they sell the shares, and then they have to have people who could buy those shares. Okay, some people have more than enough. Uh, uh, Romney was uh, uh, talked about his $20 million a year uh, in, in, in income, and he pays less in taxes than than the average worker. Okay. Right. Yeah, that is a percentage than the average worker. Now, what most capital is bought by the same people who had it before. So the top 1% own more than the bottom 90%. So if they need credit, there's no problem. They got what's called collateral. They got so much more than they could possibly use to consume that they can borrow anytime. But the average person doesn't have access to capital credit because they don't have collateral. They don't have anything accumulated. And what made Kelso important to me, and was before him, as a matter of fact, there was an idea back in 35. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Norm. You snuck in Kelso early. Okay, uh, well, okay. But, let me hold back on uh, Kelso. Uh, yeah, let, let me... Okay, let, let me hold that back okay. on Kelso. I just wanted to show you how credit is... is uh, it, it, this is what money is. It's a bunch of promises made that it's going to be backed by something. Okay, I, and what I want to get out and what I'm hearing from, from listeners is, and the emails that I've gotten from sure. last week and on this subject is, does the Federal Reserve Board lend money to the government? No, here's what, here's what not, not directly. 
Okay. They tell me how they do it indirectly. I'll, I'll tell you how they do it. Okay. I'll tell you what they did. When they got away from the original purpose, they created what's called the Open Market Committee. And instead of, gov- uh, instead of productive uh, loans to the private sector, they, they, they were going into the First World War. This is 1913? You've got to watch. you got to take each step. Okay, it, but, but it, is it, this 1913? 19, uh, okay, but, but when they went into the First World War, they didn't want to tax the people for the full cost of the war, so they went into debt, <laughs> you know, which is what we've been doing ever since. And the debt is now out of hand. It's un- unsustainable. But anyway, so what happens there, they created the Open Markets Committee so that the only one of the 12 regional feds that has really any function at all, other than research, is the New York Fed. The Open Markets Committee operates out of the New York Fed. And what they do, what they do is what the government wants goes into debt, they sell the debt paper first to the uh, to the open markets committee and they in turn sell it to China okay okay hold on they sell it to they sell it to rich people or to countries so they they're the ones who own own the uh, that's they what own I'm trying okay. uh, uh, much of it no, okay. not all of it no 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 well that's what I'm trying to get okay is so that, it that's outside of the hands of, of the federal uh, of the Federal Reserve it's other people's savings other countries, uh, fat cats, money. But the you Federal Reserve buy doesn't buy debt. some of it, Norm? Yeah. They do buy some of it? Yeah. But then they buy back some of it. And since uh, since 2007, where we went into the, into the crisis, not only did they buy some of it, but they also buy, bought toxic assets. They bought, they, they went ahead and, and used their money power to bail out what they said, banks too large to fail. Okay. We, I think we're all painfully aware of that. What's, okay. And what, also, uh, you know, buying toxic uh, mortgages that, okay. that were made because people were peddling them to people who in no way could afford to pay off the, the mortgage debt. But the Federal Reserve Board sets the interest rates, right? The, the Federal Reserve can affect the interest rate. They have what's called the federal funds rate, which is uh, which is the rate at which banks can loan to one another. And who profits from the Federal Reserve Board? Well, you see, the Federal Reserve just turns back the profits to the Treasury. So, okay, so it isn't a question of profits. What the key... So the bankers involved in the Federal Reserve System are not making anything? They're not, they're not making... That isn't the key. It's the bankers are controlling the Federal Reserve policy... And, and that is what makes the rich richer and keeps most of the Americans in very, very uh, vulnerable economic conditions. And it's slowing down the growth of the country. So if, you had, to, if you had to define the Federal Reserve Board in one sentence, it would be? Well, it would be the instrument for determining and issuing and controlling the overall money supply. Okay, Norm, we have a, we have a phone call. Hello? Are you there, caller? No, I, I guess we lost him, Norm, or we never even had him. But uh, anyway. Yeah. So, go ahead. You, you know uh, from um, Baron Rothschild, this is an important thing to understand, that uh, Baron Rothschild, many years ago, said, it really explains what's going on. He said, let me issue and control a, a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. Because if you control money power, you can control political power. And you can see this, you can see it in the election. We have a call, Norm, I believe. Are you, are you there, caller? Yes, this is Drew calling in from Washington, D.C. Uh, Drew, thanks. You have a, a call for Mr. Curlin? Correct. Go ahead. Oh, I, I guess there's a delay. Yeah. I'm listening to the to the blog, and I just wanted to say that um, I'm a I'm a big supporter of Norms, and uh, I'm part of the Justice Party, a new political party uh, that has just launched. I don't know if, how how much uh, any of the listeners know about it, but uh, uh, it's a third uh, party uh, issues based political party that uh, is actually trying to uh, to get information like this 
uh, spread across to everyone in the United States that doesn't know that uh, that um, uh, there is information um, like this that's very that's very useful for people to know that the federal government doesn't want anybody to know. So I just wanted to take a few moments just to say uh, to say thank you to Norm for uh, for letting us. Uh, have this information and for sharing it with us, and uh, we look forward to uh, to seeing um, more information like this from Norm and his organization. Thank you from Washington D.C. Bye bye. Great, thank you. You know who that is? His name is Hugh Goldsmith. He's in the uh, he's in the brooding movement. He's in uh, the what? Hugh is also a blood uh, a relative of. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Abraham Lincoln, and he oh. can trace his heritage, you know, to uh, to the time of the Mayflower. Ah. He's a very interesting guy. So what what did you say? He's a he's a rooting or what? A blood relative. Blood relative. I thought you said he's part of a looting, and I I no, thought, no, may, no, I thought no, maybe no. it was a he, banker. He's right? part of the uprooting. Uh, you know the. Oh, the uprooting. Okay. The uprooting. Movement. Not the looting. You have to be careful. I mean, you you almost started your conspiracy <laughs> oh, no, no. again with the Rothschilds, and now you got looting going on. He's a brilliant. He's a brilliant guy. We're very fortunate Whoa. to have him and. His Justice Party. Well, we should we should talk about the Justice Party at some point. But uh, now I'm going to ask the uh, brain trust I have here to weigh in with some questions, if they so desire. Uh, Count Grotenrath? What happened to your highness? Well, you just got, you got demoted. <laughs> yeah, I guess I take that. Uh, Dr. Curlin, I have uh, some preliminary questions. Um, I'm curious about your background. Now, you... Um, Kelsey was associated with Mortimer Adler, correct? Correct. And uh, what was the asso- what, what Hold on a it? second, Norm. Do you see how I asked you very nicely to delay <laughs> Kelso? And then he comes in and brings in Kelso. But do Kelso then. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'd like a little bit of the of of, of the history uh, sure. that led up to your conversion to uh, Sure. Well, uh, I uh, I come out of the University of Chicago uh, a law school with the law and economics program there. Well, well, so I may I ask, my, when, you, when did you graduate? Because uh, I finished in 1960, actually uh, uh, late 59, but the, I was in the graduating class of 60. What are the color of your eyes? How much do you weigh? And no, how tall no the, the reason I, I mean, there is a certain pertinency to my questions. Uh, sure. University of Chicago is well known as being a, a, a school espousing a particular economic uh, right. theory. Right. And I was wondering how... Um, influenced you were by that particular okay that, that's that's a good question because uh the uh the person who taught the economics side was milton friedman's uh <laughs> brother-in-law uh aaron director and he brought he, he and explain really to those who aren't who don't remember the 80s or or no economists who milton is uh, a well, nobel milton prize Friedman winning is of course uh, conservative wrote, uh, capitalism and freedom and so on right. uh my my undergraduate work was I studied uh, Keynesian economics, but uh, but in, at Chicago, uh, of course, I was exposed to uh, the uh, the uh, uh, call it the free market school of economics, and uh, I uh, I found it very interesting. I think I I, I probably I I know I ha- I really did well in it. In in the thing that that interested me most. Was that it? Uh, it was the counter to monopoly, and uh, and so when 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 I uh, when I focused on that, I could see that a market system would be vastly more democratic and objective. And Milton Friedman says the same thing. Uh, now I've had discussions with Friedman, and. and and Friedman doesn't like to. De- he says he debated Kelso and Adler back in the fifties. But uh, Friedman really, I, I had never heard that. Oh yeah, I, I, I have a letter, you know, an exchange with him that if it went public, he uh, during his life they may have asked for him to return his Nobel Prize. I thought he was really dead. Bad. He just didn't Friedman give a reason. Is and he, oh. uh, I was on a panel with him at the University of Chicago around 1967 or so on the draft, in which our positions were the same, even though I was a military man before. Uh, and and uh, so our positions were the same uh, on the concept of an all-volunteer uh, uh, military. Norm, can I stop you for a second? We've got to take a break. 
And uh, you're going to stay with us, and yeah. we will be back in probably about uh, two minutes. Thanks. Thanks.